nice warm up. So my son and I put together that little video uh, so I could talk to you about goal orientations, why they matter, and how you can foster productive goal orientations in your classroom. Uh, so it turns out that students can have different goal orientations in the classroom. So a learning or a mastery goal orientation, as we sometimes call it, involves a focus on personal improvement uh, <clears throat> and learning. Uh, whereas a performance orientation involves a focus on trying to outperform others or concerns with what other people think of your competence and ability. In that climbing video, my learning orientation is rudely shifted to a performance orientation by my son who makes a mockery of my efforts. Uh, now, if I let that get to me and I become a performance oriented climber, there's gonna be a number of consequences for my long-term motivation. Um, first, you know, I'm, I'm going to be discouraged whenever somebody outperforms me, uh, which <clears throat> uh, is gonna be a problem because honestly, that happens all the time. Uh, two, I'm likely to start focusing on the grades, which are the, the difficulty ratings of the, the climbs, uh, which is gonna distract and take away from the climbing experience itself. Uh, and three, if I really start becoming concerned about what other people think of me, um, then I'm likely to start self-handicapping. Um, so I might do things like only try easy boulders that I know I can succeed on, or make up a bunch of excuses, such as my joints are killing me, or I think I pulled a muscle in my shoulder, or I'm too old for this. Not that I ever do that now. Um, and I might even uh, stop trying. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I can't fail if I don't try in the first place. Mm -hmm. These orientations apply to the classroom. So students with a learning goal are going to be more focused on their uh, personal learning and skill development. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, they're more likely to enjoy the content. Uh, they're more likely to take risks and choose challenges. Um, and uh, they're also gonna be more likely to use deep level learning skills. On, on the other hand, students with a performance orientation are gonna be focused on their performance relative to others and whether other people think they're smart or dumb. Uh, and as a consequence, they're less likely to be interested in the content. Um, they're more likely to uh, opt out of difficult tasks, choose easy tasks or courses that are more likely to guarantee success. Um, and they're likely to choose surface, surface level learning strategies that work just fine for, you know, passing the test, getting good grades, but they don't lead to deep level enduring learning. Um, and, you know, these students might also engage in self handicapping. So especially if they have a performance avoidance goal orientation, which means their, their goal is to avoid demonstrating their incompetence they may sabotage their own performance uh, by deliberately doing things like not trying, uh, purposely procrastinating, uh, getting drunk the night before an exam, or whatever. Um, <clears throat> you know, if you're really worried about what others think of you, or if your self-worth is tied to performance metrics like grades and that, uh, then it is better to purposely fail than to risk trying and failing. Quick caveat, uh, learning and performance goal orientations actually aren't mutually exclusive and there is some benefit in having some degree of performance orientation. Uh, otherwise, you end up like my son in high school which, where you know he would do great uh, as long as he was interested in the content or respected the teacher, but otherwise he just didn't care. Uh, you know, he couldn't care less about what other people thought of him, uh, and grades, you know, just didn't matter to him. Uh, and, you, you know, honestly, it's one of the things I love about him, but it's also beneficial to be practical. You know, grades do have real world consequences, uh, and so on. Um, but it's best if those performance goals are more in the background and those learning goals are in the foreground, and then you have a better motivation pattern. So what can we do to foster a learning goal orientation? 
Um, well, here, here are eight things that you can apply in your classroom. One, uh, define success as individual learning and improvement. Um, so this is, you know, like fundamentally what a learning goal orientation is about. Um, and one way to do this is just to focus, find opportunities to recognize your students uh, whenever they show improvement, uh, development of understanding, or development of skill. Um, and it's best if that recognition is done privately. Number two uh, is you can de-emphasize social comparison and public evaluation. This is really the corollary to number one and you know, again, one of the big things uh, to focus on. So avoid doing things like announcing individual grades in front of the class, calling out students who did the best, or who did the worst, uh, telling students they should be more like so-and-so, uh, or posting charts displaying relative levels of performance or competence. Uh, you know, as an example of the latter, uh, a couple years ago, my daughter's fourth grade teacher uh, had a public chart displaying the kids' reading proficiencies. Um, and for my daughter's best friend, this became a source of shame and humiliation. And she adopted a performance avoidance orientation because of it and stopped reading um, and lost her enjoyment of reading, which was sad because at the beginning of the year, she loved reading. Um, so be careful of that, you know, public evaluation and social comparison. Um, three, Place value on effort and learning instead of high ability. Uh, so instead of saying things like, you are so talented or you are so smart, uh, focus on their effort and their strategy and their persistence and things like that. Um, four, treat mistakes as part of the learning process rather than problems. Um, so I once read that Google celebrates failures. Uh, teams who fail are rewarded with applause and even time off to contemplate next projects. Celebrating failure like this in the classroom uh, would be a good way of framing mistakes as part of the learning process. Um, another strategy is to provide students with opportunities to revise their work. Um, having your students submit drafts um, of like papers or projects um, and being allowed to get feedback and then revise in response to the feedback uh, can, you know, again, portray this idea that mistakes are just part of the learning. Nothing's perfect to begin with. Um, also, it can help to have more open-ended projects, uh, ones where the goal is to come up with lots of diverse ideas. Um, and there's understanding that some of those ideas might not be uh, practical or the best idea. Um, nevertheless, generating all those ideas, even non-working ones, um, is part of the process and understanding that. Five, focus attention on the value of learning uh, instead of the assessment of learning. Um, so we often say things like, you know, pay attention to this because it's gonna be on the test. You know, and unfortunately, uh, you know, those sort of things create more of a performance environment, you know, as with treating mistakes as problems. Uh, you know, a focus on assessment leads students to become concerned with doing it right. Uh, and it distracts them from the learning goals. Um, so whenever you give an assignment or a test, uh, talk to your students about the learning goal. Uh, what is the, the learning goal of this assignment or this test? And what is the relevance and value of it? Um, which is another thing that you know, is important. You know, it's, it's really helpful to emphasize the value of that assignment and that content. Um, what is its relevance to the students in their future careers, in their everyday lives? Those sort of things will help them develop more of a learning goal orientation. Six, uh, <clears throat> use assessments to provide feedback on learning. So assessments aren't bad, they just need to be used appropriately. Um, assessments promote performance goal orientations when they're used to compare students uh, to one another and, and, and so on. Um, however, when assessments are used to provide feedback on learning, they actually can help promote learning goal orientations. So for example, you can provide uh, feedback on papers or projects or assignments, you know, instead of just a score. Um, 
or you can review tests with students and go over and help them understand why answers are right and or wrong um, or you can have students reflect on their performance uh, and identify their learning errors all these things help to you know use assessments in ways that promote more of a learning goal orientation um, seven uh, provide your students with meaningful tasks um, so it's hard for students to focus on a learning goal when they don't see the meaning or relevance or value of the learning. Uh, you know, we got to give them something worthwhile to work with. Um, which, you know, whole video could be about that in and of itself. Um, finally, number eight, provide your students with some authority in the classroom. So, so authority refers to having some uh, ownership or choice. <clears throat> um, and when, when students are more likely to adopt a learning goal orientation when they feel a sense of autonomy and choice and ownership of the learning. Um, and I'll actually talk more about that in a, another video. So that's it for this quick introduction to uh, goal theory. Uh, and if you're interested in this, I would be happy to work with you and help you to further promote a learning goal orientation in your classroom.